Hello. Good evening, good afternoon, or good morning, wherever you may be. <laughs> um, welcome to um, a panel discussion as part of Tadaima 2021. Uh, my name is Michelle Magalong, and today I am moderating a panel discussion um, with folks that uh, is entitled Japanese American Perspectives in Allyship, Stewardship, and Community Empowerment in Historic Preservation. Um, today's session um, is we're looking at the lens of historic preservation uh, through Japanese American uh, work um, by the people and its communities and their communities. Um, as Japanese Americans have long been involved in historic preservation efforts, notably in historic neighborhoods and with World War II confinement sites in a variety of ways, including landmark designations, artwork, um, art and humanities work, community development efforts, and advocacy. So today's panel discussion um, provides Japanese American perspectives in historic preservation work, particularly in the importance of allyship, stewardship, and community empowerment. Um, so I am thrilled today to have an illustrious panel of um, participants, um, including uh, you see on your screen here, and they're going to present in the order as I um, introduce them first. We have Karen Kai. Um, Karen has been participating in community planning and historic preservation efforts in San Francisco's Japantown since the mid-1990s and is the co-author of the groundbreaking Japantown Cultural Heritage and Economic Sustainability Strategy, JCHES, that underlies the Japantown Cultural Heritage District. Um, Karen is part was part of the legal team representing Japantown in reclaiming the historic Japanese YWCA Issei Women's Building and has remained active in stewardship efforts that have followed, including the recognition of the site as a San Francisco landmark and its listing on the National Register of Historic Places. She currently serves on the board of API HIP, Asian and Pacific Islander Americans in Historic Preservation, which I too am a part of, and uh, as a member of the Issei Women's Legacy Committee, uh, Project Committee. And then following Karen, you will also get a chance to hear from Rosalind Sagara, um, who is a Sunset uh, public and architectural historian based in Southern California. She's currently the neighborhood outreach manager at the Los Angeles Conservancy, uh, where she develops local preservation um, uh, leaders through Los Angeles through, uh, work through Los Angeles County. Rosalind has co-authored the award-winning Asian Americans in Los Angeles Historic Context for Survey LA and serves on the board of Save Our Chinatown Committee as well as a API HIP. Um, and then you will hear from Dan, Dan Sakura, who for over 50 years has worked in partnership with Japanese American organizations and the National Park Service to create, expand, and protect World War II confinement sites. As a descendant of Minidoka survivors, Dan has helped create the Minidoka National Monument, um, expand it to include the Farm in a Day and Eagle Dale Ferry Dock and protect it from a power line. He's helped preserve Tuli Lake and Honouli Uli sites as national monuments. He's currently working on um, to pass by bipartisan legislation to create the Amachi National Historic Site. And then we have, if, if, if we can get Bill, if not, we're, we're waiting to get Bill on the screen. But last, you will hear from Bill Watanabe, um, who uh, has extensive work in uh, Little Tokyo in Los Angeles. Um, and he serves um, as the founding chair of Little Tokyo Historical Society. He serves on my uh, board as chair of API HIP. Um, and he will be talking about his extensive work um, in Little Tokyo. Uh, particularly on the Little Tokyo Community Impact Fund. Um, and so without further ado, I would uh, like to hand this off uh, for, for Karen to kick us off today. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Michelle, and also to Kimiko and everyone at Tadaima. This is really a great opportunity, and I've um, it's just a little daunting to uh, compress so much material into eight minutes. Um, that's our goal. And so I, at the outset, I want to acknowledge that this is a really compressed summary. It's a summary of a summary, really. And um, 
there are so many people and organizations that were involved in the effort around 1830 Sutter, which is also known now as the Japanese YWCA slash Issei Women's Building. And that I could go for 20 minutes naming them and acknowledging their work. But I unfortunately don't have the time to do that, but there will be ways to find out about that. And I'll hopefully get to that before the end. But uh, 25 years ago, um, the building, 1830 Sutter, uh, which was home to the Nihomachi Little Friends Preschool um, in San Francisco, Japantown, uh, was being evicted. They were going, the building was going to be sold and the preschool was going to be out on the street. This was dear to my heart because my son had attended preschool there. And I wasn't the only one who felt this way. The community was really gathering strength and trying to find a way to save this building. And um, it, what was interesting, we all kind of knew where it was. It was familiar to us as the home of a very cherished community organization, but we didn't really know much about building itself or its history or why it was uh, significant. And this is kind of the start for me of a 25 year journey of working with this 1830 Sutter building that launched me into the whole field of historic preservation. And so this is the short version or as short as I can get it right now. Um, basically, once the news that the the San Francisco YWCA, which was listed on the title as the owner of the building, uh, announced that they were going to sell it. Um, and it was at a price that the community could not afford. Uh, there was a lot of work and people um, eventually got around to looking at historic documents and found some that said this building was purchased with funds gathered by the Japanese American women for this purpose, and they had asked their sister organization, the San Francisco YWCA, to hold the building in trust for them because that was the only way to get around the infamous California alien land law that otherwise would have prohibited them from owning the property. So with this knowledge, um, the, the community tried to negotiate with the Y and we're told, no, it's our building, go away. We're, we're gonna sell it, it's our building. If you have money, you can come and buy it. Um, but they were not moved. They did not believe the evidence that there was a trust and it was a legally enforceable trust that had been created. And as a result, we decided, well, there's one recourse, we're gonna sue. And I am a lawyer. I was involved with the Korematsu legal team. And so I said, well, why not? You know, we've we've rewritten history before, we've corrected history before, and this is another opportunity to do that. And here's where I acknowledge there are a ton of other attorneys who worked on this case and did incredible work. There were others who supported all the work as well. But um, as this lawsuit proceeded, um, one of the real benefits that we didn't appreciate so much at the time was how much knowledge and information we were gaining about our community, about the Issei women particularly, and um, what the amazing obstacles were that were being overcome by people that no one ever thought about at that point. You know, when you thought of an Issei woman, you thought of the picture of the Japanese woman on the docks looking a little bewildered in days, looking for their husband uh, who they were picture brides. And that was all the image. And what we found at the Japanese Y was that these women were, were incredibly dynamic community builders and really role models for all of us. And we pursued the lawsuit. It was pretty bitter. But in the end, 
there was a settlement and Nihomachi Little Friends became the owner of the building. And this was a really remarkable moment because Little Friends said, well, we've listened to what everyone has said. We're really grateful to become the owners of this building because it will give us the stability we need to continue. And we will not only be the owners, but we will be stewards. And that concept of stewardship, of not only taking care of a place, but in the case of Little Friends saying, we are going to explore and share the legacy of the Issei women. And we're going to keep that alive because it is so important to us and our community. And that has been um, a very remarkable process in itself. Little Friends, you have to understand it this time, was a preschool. It had never owned property before and was taking on all of these responsibilities of property ownership, of being the steward. And the first things they did were to have a um, historic features report done and to create an educational brochure to share the history. And I think that showed kind of their spirit and where they wanted to go with this. And it has played out and has been truly that uh, kind of supportive stewardship that every community needs. So the, the organization also needed to do a capital campaign because there was a lot of deferred maintenance. There was the purchase to pay off. And that was another thing that the organization had never done. So all of these things were supported by community, by people who uh, came to recognize that this building touched on so many legacies and issues. I mean, people who were interested in architecture because it was built by Julia Morgan were supportive of what we were doing. There was a Another very strong theme was that during World War II, the building had been leased to the American Friends Service Committee, who did a tremendous number of amazing projects, not only for Japanese Americans, but for other disenfranchised groups, including the African American and the LGBT community. So understanding that there was this bigger picture um, people started to take more note of the building. And in fact, as all of this was happening over, we're, we're rolling through decades here now, um, the uh, city planning staff really came to know and mark 1830 Sutter Street as a notable place. And as people who were doing good things along the lines they wanted to see done in uh, preservation and planning work. And so when it was, I guess, I'm not even remembering how long ago it was, but at some point they put Little Friends on their historic Landmarks Works project. And they said, okay, this gets your, you going in the direction of becoming a historic building. Um, but it was really when um, federal funds became available to increase the number of sites that were either related to civil rights or marginalized communities that there was money to put into helping groups get landmarked and get onto the federal register, the national register. And Little Friends was one of the first in the, the group to um, have that opportunity and the grant provided us the opportunity to have a top-notch researcher, uh, Donna Graves, do the report for the um, landmarking. And we proceeded on to do that. And the National Register process also engaged in getting the state register listing. And kind of um, ironically and a little bit unusually, the last thing we did was local landmarking. And so just earlier this year, just a few months ago, um, we finally became a San Francisco city landmark. 
And so this was all the traditional historic preservation kind of efforts, um, but Little Friends continued on and applied for grants to do the education piece. And now through grants uh, from the California Civil Liberties Public Education Fund and the Japanese American Confinement Sites Program on the national level, we're working on developing a website that hopefully uh, the first phase will be up at the end of this year. Um, that will basically allow people to explore 1830 Sutter and learn more about everything that I left out in this presentation. <laughs> and, um, and we hope at the end of the year, you tune in and find us. Thank, Thank you, you, Michelle. Thank you, Karen. Yes, no, and it's difficult to put in years and years of effort into eight minutes. I think you did a beautiful job of giving a little taste of even your own involvement um, in such landmark work. Um, and so I'm going to uh, pass it on to Rosalind. Um, Great. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for the invite to participate in today's program. And today I'll be talking briefly about two landmark nominations, very briefly. I'll do my best to go through these fast. Um, two landmark nominations that are associated with Japanese American history in Los Angeles. Um, next slide, please. So before I get into the specifics of the properties, um, I thought it would be helpful to provide some context to better understand the local historic context and conditions in which these properties have existed. So in 1910, Los Angeles was home to the largest Issei Japanese population in the US. A variety of push and pull factors drove Japanese American settlement and development patterns in Los Angeles. Pictured on the left is an image of Mrs. B.G. Miller declaring her desire to push out Japanese families from Hollywood in the early 1920s. At this time, California was tightening its alien land law, which barred Asian immigrants from owning land, and signs such as these reflected the actions taken by individuals and community groups to keep their neighborhoods white only. Um, the practice of red line emerged um, from the National Housing Act of 1934. Um, the FHA commissioned the Homeowners Loan Corporation to create a survey of U.S. neighborhoods and rank them by security and desirability. The survey assigned neighborhoods grades ranging from A, which were most desirable and coded in green, um, to D, which were least desirable, hazardous, um, and therefore a higher loan risk, and these were coded in red. Um, in the middle, we have an image of, um, if you can go back um, to, um, of Los Angeles. Um, and pictured on the right is an index card filed by um, Issei pioneer Rohei Nishiyama um, as he and his American born son, Miki, navigated land ownership restrictions in Los Angeles. While for some, Boyle Heights, um, na the neighborhood represented um, an undesirable neighborhood for others it offered opportunity and I'll return to this a bit later. Um, lastly, I'd like to note that as of this year, only one, actually less than 1% of the city's historic cultural monuments reflect Japanese American heritage in LA. Next slide, please. So first I'll talk about the Sakai Kozawa resident slash Tokyo Flores and Pole sign. Um, it's historic cultural monument 1198. Um, and added to the local landmark registry in 2019. Built in 1911, this Tudor craftsman style residence is in Silver Lake and was purchased by the Sakai Kozawa family in 1960. They raised their family here and operated their longtime retail florist business from 1960 to 2006 from this location. Sumi and Frank Kozawa, um, who are pictured um, on the slide, were responsible for the landscaped grounds, which include a Japanese garden featuring rare plantings, koi ponds, wooden bridges, rocks, and circular pathways. The Sokai Kozawa family 
um, members also planted trees, poppies, and vegetables in the upper terrace for personal and business use. In December of 2018, the property was listed for sale by the Kozawa family, leaving its future uncertain. In June 2019, the Little Tokyo Historical Society nominated the building for local historic cultural monument recognition, and the Conservancy helped to prepare um, and supported the nomination. Next slide. In addition to the historic home, the property included a number of cultural significant buildings, structures, and features that were actually being contemplated for demolition um, after the nomination had been successfully um, uh, passed. Um, so uh, we learned about this in 2020. Um, thankfully, after consultation with the stakeholders, city staff, and the Cultural Heritage Commission, um, the new owner uh, has presented a site vision that does respect and integrate these components and the site's Japanese American heritage with future development. We support the developer's current vision and we are looking forward to continued conversations about the new project. Next slide, please. Now I'm gonna to turn to um, a pending nomination we have for the Nishiyama residence slash Otomi-san Japanese restaurant, which is located in Boyle Heights. This nomination was submitted in partnership with the Boyle Heights Community Partners Organization last year. Japanese families began settling in this neighborhood in the 1920s. They found the neighborhood to be welcoming to working class immigrants and free from discriminatory housing practices prevalent in other neighborhoods of Los Angeles. Access to housing, proximity to Little Tokyo, and the development of religious and cultural institutions were other important factors driving Japanese settlement in Boyle Heights. Rohe Nishiyama, who I mentioned before, um, was an Issei immigrant who um, became an entrepreneur and um, was first associated with this property in 1924. That year, he contracted um, Jay Tanaguchi to build a one-story commercial building in front of his residence. Within a few months, the residence, which had originally fronted the, the street, which is east, was moved to the rear property line as pictured here on this slide. Next slide. With this property, the Nishiyama family created economic mobility for Japanese and Japanese Americans in Los Angeles during a time when opportunities for Japanese um, immigrants were limited due to their inability to own property, housing and job discrimination, and World War II Japanese American incarceration. The residents would house multiple generations of the Nishiyama family and would meet additional housing and community needs for the local Japanese American community. In the 1930s, city directories list various tenants of Japanese ancestry residing at the residence, indicating its use as a Japanese rooming slash boarding house. Now also during this period, a portion of the residence housed a Japanese language school. During World War II, the Nishiyama family was first incarcerated at Gila River concentration camp and later um, at Tule Lake concentration camp. Uh, Miki Nishiyama and his family returned to the residence during the post-war resettlement period. And according to family members, the second floor of the residence was occupied by single male boarders of Japanese ancestry in the 1950s. Pictured here are three generations of the Nishiyama family who lived at the property in the 1950s and 60s. Next slide, please. The property also narrates a story of Japanese American entrepreneurship in Boyle Heights. The commercial building originally housed a Japanese operated grocery store and later included a Japanese operated florist shop and barber shop. In the 1950s, the grocery store was converted to a food establishment. In 1956, Otemo Sushi Cafe, um, now called Otomisan Japanese Restaurant, opened in the easternmost storefront of the commercial building. Today, it is the last remaining Japanese restaurant in the neighborhood and believed to be one of the oldest continuously operating Japanese restaurants in Los Angeles. At right, we see a contemporary view. And um, last slide. 
Um, the restaurant remains largely, largely unchanged since it was established according to longtime residents. It has been widely covered by local media and it's a much beloved um, legacy business in the neighborhood. Um, the current um, restaurant operator continues a legacy of Japanese homestyle cooking in the neighborhood. And um, these projects that I've mentioned here today are helping to tell a more complete story of Los Angeles while engaging Japanese Americans and the broader community in stewardship of these important historic places. Thanks a lot. Great, good, good evening. Uh, my name is Dan Sakura. I'm grateful for this opportunity. I'm coming to you from the Washington DC area, the ancestral homeland of the Anacostan and Piscataway peoples. Thank you for the opportunity to talk about two great projects. One is Amachi and one at Minidoka. Next slide. At Amachi, I'm gonna spend a little bit of time talking about the allyship with the native community, uh, the Cheyenne and Arapaho peoples. This slide shows the uh, massacre of over 200 Arapaho and Cheyenne native peoples in the Sand Creek Massacre of 1864. Next slide. Just to orient folks, here's a map uh, produced by the National Park Service of uh, Eastern Colorado. You can see in the center there, the Sand Creek Massacre site. Uh, that is where the US Army massacred um, innocent Native American women and children. And um, the arrow below shows the um, site of the G Grenada, which is the site of the Amachi camp um, located in Prowers, Prowers County, um, Colorado on the Arkansas River. Next slide, please. Uh, this slide shows a Cheyenne and Arapaho group of tribal leaders who were seeking to negotiate uh, peace with the um, Army and Colorado territorial leadership in 1864. It was highlights um, Ochini, who is Amachi's father. He's on the second, on the middle, uh, the second to the right on the row, the seated row. He was later uh, murdered at Sand Creek at the massacre. Next slide. So his daughter, Amachi Ochini Prowers, also known as Walking Woman is the person that Amachi is named after. She was a Southern Cheyenne tribal leader. She lived from 1846 to 1905. She was married to John Wesley Prowers um, after whom Prowers County, Colorado is named where Grenada and Amachi is located. And she testified in Congress, this will be familiar to the Japanese American community in support of an investigation into the massacre and redress for the victims. If enacted, the pending Amachi National Historic Site legislate, if enacted, the bill would create the Amachi National Historic Site, which would be the only unit of the national park system named after a Native American woman. Next slide. So the partnership I wanted to highlight today is with the National Park Service, and we in the Japanese American community are extremely fortunate to have the support of the National Park Service at every level, starting at the field level, the regional office level, and the Washington office level, as well as leader, historic leadership by the Secretary of the Interior and the White House. The Park Service currently manages four campsites, um, sites of incarceration as units of the National Park Service. And because of their location, it's really critical to have a federal agency partner who's able to manage these sites and protect them from threats. At Amachi, uh, our great partner, John Hopper and the Amachi Preservation Side, Sci Society and the great um, Grenada High School realized that he is not gonna be able to be there to run the Amachi Preservation Society forever. And he wanted to, he identified the National Park Service as a long-term steward for the Amachi site to continue his work. And we're grateful for that commitment to ensure a smooth transition and long-term manager of the site. The National Park Service has also played critical important roles through archeology, span um, the work of Jeff Burton, National Historic Landmark designation, National Historic Register, as well as funding through the Japanese American Confinement Sites, JAX grant program, 
we are incredibly fortunate to have this partnership and we work to build that relationship. Next slide. So the Amachi National Historic Site Act, HR 2497, um, and Associated Special Resource Study builds on a model for preserving sites, what I call the Russian doll model. And that includes three groups. Uh, number one, the first doll starts with the camp partners. So in this case, it's Amachi Historical Society II and John Hopper Amachi Preservation Society. The next doll is the Japanese American community um, the Japanese American Confinement Sites Consortium, J Japanese American Citizens League, uh, Kimiko and her teams, Densho, and many other partners. Then the third doll, and this broadens it out much broader, is to groups like uh, the National Parks Conservation Association, uh, National Trust for Historic Preservation, uh, the Sand Creek Massacre Foundation, which is the local friends group for the nearby Sand Creek Massacre National Historic Site, and other partners. Next slide. So in terms of the Amachi legislation, we're really pleased with the outstanding bipartisan leadership of Congressman Nagus and Congressman Buck, located in, whose district includes the site in Eastern Colorado. We are very fortunate to see an overwhelming bipartisan vote, 416 to two in July. The bill's been reported to the Senate Energy and Natural Resources Committee. And we're grateful for the leadership of Senators Bennett and Hickenlooper to secure a hearing on the bill. We're pleased this week to see a survivor's letter um, signed by camp survivors, including um, former member of Congress, Mike Honda, who had, is an Amachi survivor. Our goal is to pass this bill by February, 2022, next February to mark the 80th anniversary of Executive Order 9066. Next slide. If you have any questions on legislation, please contact Tracy Coppola at npca.org. Her contact information is on this slide and uh, in the chat. She's doing an outstanding job working with the Amachi partners to move the legislation. Next slide, please. So um, I'm gonna finish up with Minidoka. I've, my family has a, um, I have a, I'm a descendant of Minidoka survivors. I've worked over 20 years to preserve the site. And I just wanted to flag that there's a, incredible threat to Minidoka posed by LS Power, a New York uh, private equity firm to build a massive wind farm located just north of Minidoka. If you have any questions or want to learn more about this project, uh, please add you, put your um, contact information in the chat or check out the Friends of Minidoka website, minidoka.org or the Minidoka Pilgrimage Committee website. Uh, we're working together to try to ensure that our voices are heard in the public process and that this sacred site is preserved for the benefit of future generations. Thank you. Okay, um, I can get started. My name is Bill Watanabe and um, I've been working in Little Tokyo for about the last 100, excuse me, for the last 40 years or so. Uh, Little Tokyo is a historic neighborhood. It's uh, about 140 years old, not quite, uh, but it started around 1884. So uh, while I was working in Little Tokyo, uh, one of the projects uh, that I was executive director of is the Little Tokyo Service Center. And we became a community development corporation. And uh, being a CDC allowed us to do a lot of community economic development, affordable housing development, that kind of thing. And our neighborhood was Little Tokyo. And so we were very aware of uh, trying to preserve not only the history, but the culture of the Little Tokyo uh, community and what it represented as part of the Japanese American community. Um, I also helped to start the Little Tokyo Historical Society, uh, which is a, a, a group that focuses just on Little Tokyo. Uh, and so we've been doing a number of projects like setting up uh, walking tours, um, naming sites of some of the pioneers. Uh, we have a writing contest about Little Tokyo uh, and we do a lot of media work and seminars, that kind of thing. And one of the projects that um, uh, I've been working on recently is called the Little Tokyo Community 
impact fund. Uh, and this was set up to try to preserve uh, commercial real estate and to be able to assist legacy small businesses in Little Tokyo. And these would be businesses that have uh, been in Little Tokyo or they're part of the community. They've, part of, they've probably been around for maybe more than one or two generations. Uh, and so we'd hate to see gentrification and economic changes push them out uh, because then Little Tokyo would not exist anymore. So uh, the Community Impact Fund was set up to see if there's a way that we can uh, help the small businesses. Uh, and the way to do that would be to own property and uh, to be able to rent it to these legacy businesses so that they can stay in Little Tokyo. So I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about the Community Impact Fund. Uh, if we go to the next slide. Uh, this is a picture of Little Tokyo. It's not very large. It's only about three blocks by three blocks. Of course, before World War II, it was 10 times bigger than this, but now uh, it's uh, never grew back to the size that it was before World War II. Next slide. Okay, so uh, I had mentioned about gentrification. Uh, there is a subway station that's going to open up in Little Tokyo. Uh, maybe by next year, and uh, once that opens up, uh, it's pretty much guaranteed that uh, land prices and rents are going to just keep escalating even higher and higher, and the only businesses that can stay in business would be those with the, the deep pockets or with a national chain connection, something like that. Next slide. So uh, a group of us decided, why don't we start something like a real estate investment trust or what they call a REIT, only make it a community benefit REIT uh, where people can invest money, purchase real estate, but have a dual purpose. One would be that each investor uh, will get a return on their investment, although it probably won't be what they could get in a, uh, a typical REIT. Uh, it might be half that. So they'll still get something, but it would be less than market. But the other benefit or reward they might get as an investor is to know that they're helping the community. Uh, and so we, we do have a number of folks who are willing to forego the top dollar return uh, for the benefit of knowing that they're helping the community. So next slide. The impact fund, uh, basically we would like to get investors to put money into our fund, allow us to buy real estate, commercial properties, uh, rent it out, and then from the money that we get, uh, investors would get money back, and then we would also save some of the money to help subsidize the small businesses. Next slide. So we have uh, two classes, Class A and Class B. Uh, and so to be an investor at the Class A level would require a $1,000 investment. Now, this is not a donation. Uh, we are set up as a C corporation, a, a public benefit C corporation. Uh, and so you're allowed to purchase up to two shares. So you can invest up to $2,000. We have a class B uh, and to be a class B investor would require purchasing or investing two class B shares or $10,000 and up. So uh, <clears throat> you can purchase as many B shares as you like. Uh, as long as you don't uh, exceed 10% of your, your, your net worth. Uh, we also have a board of directors uh, that elected by the investors. Uh, and um, we just got started like two years ago. We haven't purchased any property. Uh, and so we haven't been able to give any returns yet. Next slide. So we have a board of directors. Uh, made up uh, different folks, uh, community folks, uh, money people, uh, banking people, PR folks to help us to try to get this uh, impact fund off the ground. Uh, as far as I know, I think we're the, we're the only one of our kind uh, operating uh, that's focused on small businesses. So we're kind of charting new territory here as we move forward and the board of directors has to make these kind of new decisions on their own. Next slide. So uh, businesses have been closing in Little Tokyo. Of course, small businesses are tough no matter 
how you cut it. Restaurant business is tough, but COVID has also had a, an impact. So we're we're even more inspired to try to get out there. We we put an offer in to buy a piece of property earlier this year, but uh, the sale did not go through. Uh, the owner decided not to sell, but at least we have enough money to be in the game. Uh, our goal is to try to raise two million dollars. We we have about seven hundred thousand dollars in the bank, uh, which isn't enough to purchase outright, but at least it uh, helps us to get in the game. And next, so this is our website. Uh, it will give you the information about uh, the organization itself, and um, we are trying to still uh, get more investors. Uh, investors have to be in the state of California, but uh, hopefully that um, we can continue to grow and reach our goal and be able to purchase a piece of property from there, maybe a second piece of property and grow and grow and grow from there. Uh, and we'll see how it goes. Maybe next year we'll have uh, a success story to share uh, if I can get back to and talk about it. Okay, with that, I will stop my presentation. Thank you, Bill. Thank you, everyone, for your wonderful, very quick, very brief, I know, <laughs> presentation. Um, this just gives, I mean, it's not even like the tip of the iceberg. It's like the snowflake on top of the iceberg, I guess, or the, or the little drop of water um, in the, of the iceberg of what all the great work that is happening um, from the Japanese American perspectives in historic preservation. Um, and so, I wanted to, I, I don't see any uh, questions yet. And so I have I have some questions um, for the presenters. And, you know, with today's theme, talking about allyship and stewardship um, in our communities, uh, Dan, you touched a little bit um, about um, even how, even in your presentation to start off with where Amachi, the name came from, right? To tie it back to even before World War II, way before World War II, right? Um, to the to the first peoples of, of that land, um, and even to show your allyship in that way. And so I think that's a great way for me to ask um, everyone, including Dan, um, but for all of you uh, to just if there's a, um, any ways uh, you can uh, share with the audience how you show your allyship, um, connecting your roots as you've all shared um, being Japanese American, but how that has informed how you do solidarity work in historic preservation. Michelle, thank you. If I could start, um, I've been extremely fortunate to have opportunities to work for the Conservation Fund and the National Park Foundation and Department of Interior. And based on my experience working at, with camp preservation, I've been able to feel the pain of other communities. Um, I've done work at the with the families of Flight 93, preserving the Flight 93 National Memorial. I've worked with members of the African-American community to preserve the Martin Luther King Jr. birth home and life home, create a new park unit at Natchez that tells the story of the, um, in, the enslavement of African-Americans at the second largest um, slave trade site in the country. Uh, preserve the Freedom Riders National Monument site in Birmingham, Alabama, creating two national parks relating to Harriet Tubman, new national park related to African-American U.S. colored troops in Kentucky. So my experience has really given me a tame framework and template for conser conserving and preserving nationally significant historic properties that tell stories of courage and hardship uh, like at camp. Mm-hmm. Thanks, Dan. And that's that's a lot of accomplishments, right? Um, and 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 your your solidarity work and allyship work in conservation. So thank you for that. Um, Bill or Karen or Roslyn, would you like to share how you do your solidarity work as an ally in the field of historic preservation with other communities? Well. Um... I'll go ahead. Uh, actually, uh, throughout my career, I've always believed in collaboration and uh, trying to work together that uh, the more we can get together with others, the stronger we can be. Uh, so 
um, I, you know, I helped to start the Little Tokyo Historical Society, and we have worked uh, very closely with like the LA Conservancy, the National Trust for Historic Preservation, um, and, and uh, the Chinatown Historical Society as well. Uh, and so uh, if we, you know, the Asian American community is fairly significant in LA, uh, but it's not as big as say the Latino community or others. Uh, and so by getting together, we can be a stronger voice. Uh, one of the things we're trying to do is start a small business, uh, heritage business uh, support program in the city of LA. Uh, similar, uh, borrowing off of what they did in San Francisco uh, and also in San Antonio. Uh, and so if we can do that, uh, that would be a big boost for our legacy small businesses throughout Los Angeles. Uh, and so we're trying to form a coalition uh, uh, Rosalind has been very active to try to pull together different voices so that this could be a citywide program. So collaboration is what's needed in historic preservation. It's tough to do it, everything on your own. Uh, and so the more people you can get to work with and support you, the better. Great. Karen or Rosalind? I, I can go. Um, I would just add, I agree totally with what's been said. Um, collaboration is key. I think the two projects that I um, I highlighted um, couldn't have been realized without our partnerships with community-based organizations. So in the case of Tokyo Florist, you know, Little Tokyo Historical Society um, taking the, the lead um, and, and also with um, the current Nishiyama residents um, working with a local partner in Boyle Heights as well. And I think it's kind of um, knowing like where um, our strengths are and, and, and also kind of realizing that um, we're not always the experts um, with, you know, when certain um, challenges come up and how can we um, bring in the voices of, of, of other experts, um, all kind of with the common goal of, you know, our hopefully our shared, uh, a shared common goal. And, and I think that that, that is how, um, you know, I think the Conservancy can be helpful to, to other community organizations or local residents. Um, you know, I think that, um, of course we all have our, um, personal motivations in, 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 in supporting causes and projects. Um, for me, like the, the Nishiyama um, residents um, project has been um, really um, personally uplifting in many ways. I think that it has um, allowed me to explore, you know, my own Japanese American heritage in Los Angeles and um, have conversations with people um, that, um, you know, I, I wouldn't have otherwise met um, outside of this project. So um, yeah, that, that's what I'd like to add. Thank you, Rosalind. And Karen? Um, I think for me, a lot of it is involved in education and doing educational outreach. Um, I've been involved in a program at a local elementary school, Rosa Parks Elementary, that also houses our Japanese bilingual bicultural program. And we take jazz musicians in and I get to do a historical tour of the community for all the kids, which is a very mixed group. Um, racially and economically. And we not only look at Japanese sites, but we go up to um, the Western terminus of the Underground Railroad, which is physically in the Japantown Cultural District. And it's a surprise for both African-American kids and their families and the Japanese Americans to realize how intertwined the history of our communities are. So spreading that kind of effort. Um, I Right now, we are just getting a new median put up in Geary Boulevard, which uh, basically divided uh, Japantown and Western Edition during redevelopment and all the evictions. And I was able to be involved in 
preparation of these panels that reflect the history of the communities that were um, affected. So Japantown, Western Edition, and St. Francis Square, which is an amazing story of uh, unions working to integrate communities. And the final thing I, I really want to mention is to raise the voices of younger people because that is a struggle um, that is ongoing. There are younger people out there saying, hey, you know, you guys need to come up to date, think about things, do things a different way, because this is going to be our community and we need to share with them and interact with them more. And some of that is just saying, hey, folks, you know what? There was a great thing on the Facebook page from these guys. And it's it's starting to happen and it's really encouraging. And I love the the young folks I get to work with. Thank you, Karen. And um, I know we have two questions. I'm gonna flip the order just for um, continuing what this conversation. So the flip side, right? Um, I was asking about how stewardship and allyship from the JA perspective, I'm not JA, but you know, from your own uh, outward, right? Um, but also, what is it, you know, in terms of the challenges of stewardship and allyship of others coming into doing work related to Japanese American preservation, stewardship of historic sites? Um, if you can, if you feel um, inclined to answer, you know, to share with us, what are your challenges that you face from, you know, outsiders? Outsiders could be however it's identified, right? I'm an outsider as a Filipino American, but I'm an ally, right? Um, but it, so, you know, how do you, how do you uh, deal with these challenges of folks telling um, you this is the way it's done or it should be done um, versus what you know, you know, from your own cultural and historical um, lenses as Japanese Americans doing this work? So I invite anyone who would like to answer that. Well, I would like to say that I've been, in my 20 years of advocacy, been grateful for the outstanding support, really, at almost every turn from members of the larger community. Um, I think if the challenge is outsiders, is not enough. Uh, but every, you know, I, we cannot do, preserve these camps by ourselves. We cannot add them to the national national park system. We need allyships and partnerships. We need people like um, John Jarvis, the former director of the National Park Service, who helped establish Thule Lake and Hana Uli Uli as you know, the National Park Service. And I am always looking for that third and outer layer of that doll because we in the Japanese American community need to leverage our strength with partnerships. And in the case, for example, of Minidoka, it's partnerships with other groups where we have common allyship and we share interests in reaching an outcome that that preserves both the the campsite as well as the natural resources nearby. Thanks, Dan. Uh, I would add, uh, in terms of nonprofit community-based ownership, uh, the project that Karen's talked about, uh, the building that the YWCA uh, is able to uh, control is important to try to preserve because if some outside entity tries to buy that property, tear you know tear it down or convert it into, we, we had one group who wanted to convert the old Union Church into a go-go club back in the, back in the 1990s. Uh, but you never know. I mean, people who have money and buy these things think they could turn it into a bar or something. Uh, and so uh, I really believe in community ownership of these things to try to preserve it. Little Tokyo Service Center now owns three buildings in the National Historic Landmark District. There are, there are 13 buildings altogether. And so they're very committed to preserving not only the building, uh, but also the culture that goes with it and to try to make it a part of the community itself. Thanks, Bill. Karen or Rothman, do you have, would you like to respond? Yeah, I, I'd like to uh, cross back and, and touch into uh, Bill's um, emphasis of, on small business, because I think that's one of the cultural areas, one of the cultural markers that um, has really epitomized the remaining Japan towns is the, the small businesses that carry on traditions. And there's a lot of pressure 
on them right now, especially with the pandemic. And what I keep hearing um, in San Francisco is, oh, we've got to get more businesses from Japan. And it's like, yeah, that's great. Some of them are very authentic. Some of them reflect current Japanese culture, but you also have to preserve those small family businesses and the Japanese American traditions and don't let them get ground under in the rush to find the latest thing from Japan. And so that's a hard battle to fight because I have people who I love and work with saying, oh, but that's really good ramen, <laughs> you know, as opposed to the little corner shop that maybe has so-so ramen, but the gyoza are great, you know, <laughs> um, and it's a family-run business. So it's it's an ongoing effort to, to conserve those kinds of places. Thanks, Karen. And Roslyn, we have a few, like two more minutes before we wrap up. So. I, I would just say with the example of um, the Otomi-san Japanese restaurant, you know, it is, it is a legacy business um, in our city. Um, it's what the property is probably most well known um, for. Um, and, you know, as, as Bill mentioned, we don't yet have a city um, wide legacy business program um, that could help a legacy business owner. Um, so, you know, sometimes historic preservation tools are not, um, are not the only thing that are, that is going to be helpful, and that we need um, other types of program and assistance to support places like um, our longtime businesses um, that might not meet the the registration requirements for historic, you know, status, um, or that may not um, choose to to seek that. So um, hopefully, you know, there are. There are additional tools that we can rely on to, to support these important places. Thanks, Rosalind. And I know we're, we're on the last minute. Um, Dan, I know there's a question. I don't know if you want to type that into the comments about how folks can have a say with Minidoka. Where can they get more info? And do they have to be, you know, um, associated with Minidoka as, as, as descendants or family members? Well, well very, very good question. So. Right now, the Bureau of Land Management, a federal agency, is having a 30-day or, or has extended the public comment period to October 20th. So members of the community and our partners can submit public comments to the Bureau of Land Management regarding. Oh, we lost Dan. He froze we, for a second. No. <laughs> we also, this. Okay, sorry. So October 20th, where you can get more information, it's two organizations working together that I'm involved with, um, the Friends of Minidoka, which is minidoka.org, and the Minidoka Pilgrimage Committee, minidokapilgrimages.org. They have really good information on their website. And in terms of Minidoka connections, you know, this is a threat to all of our collective heritage. It doesn't matter if you belong to from Minidoka. For example, I'm doing a lot of, I'm working with the Amachi partners on this legislation and I'm glad to be part of their team. And I think within the last, I don't know, 15, 20 years, thanks to the leadership of the Consignment Sites Co Coalition Consortium or Coalition, there's there's been a lot more all camp sentiment and a lot more uh, groups working together regardless of where your camp is. So if you were Thule or Poston, you know, this is a threat to everyone. And um, I encourage everyone in the community to get involved and to fight this uh, proposed wind project. So um, again, minidoka.org or minidokapilgrimages.org. Thanks, Dan. And I, um, unfortunately, we, our hour is up. <laughs> so um, again, I thank each of you for sharing a little bit, a little taste of all the amazing work you do, your commitment and dedication to preserving Japanese American historic sites and cultural resources and being an ally across um, the different types of preservation we all do. And so I want to do a really quick plug. There is a second part of this um, discussion. Um, we're gonna flip it now, uh, actually next Thursday, um, 12 noon, 3 p.m. Eastern, or uh, 12 noon Pacific, 3 p.m. Eastern. Uh, we're gonna talk about um, what it looks like to be an ally in, um, 
in preservation. Um, some of the folks are doing work in Japanese American related work um, and others not, right? But just showing how we work across and, 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 and demonstrate solidarity in all of this work we do. I think we're very, all much very much seated in the core issues of equity and justice in preservation, but also how do we work together as we, you heard a lot today about collaboration, partnership, um, you know, it's, we have to sustain um, these efforts uh, together um, and not a separate or alone. So I think each of you again, I thank uh, Kumiko and the Tadaima team for, for allowing us to be in this space together. And I thank you and um, wish everyone a, a good weekend. Uh, we'll try to stay safe here, Dan, uh, as we're in the DMV. So, <laughs> but thank you, everyone.